Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to talk about Valhalla, not Odyssey. I'm sorry, Odyssey. You'll be remembered in my heart as not only my favorite Assassin's Creed game, but as one of my favorite games of all time. Okay, okay, okay. For all of you that are triggered about me saying Odyssey was my favorite Assassin's Creed game, that doesn't mean I'm not a hardcore SEO fan. SEO number one! Just a little bit of a warning. This video will have minor spoilers for the beginning and middle of the game, but not any ending spoilers or special ending spoilers. <clears throat> Valhalla starts out by introducing our main character, Eivor, who is the child of the leaders of a decent-sized clan somewhere in the middle of Norway. He then gets separated from his family during the peace meeting when an enemy clan attacks. Much of this is expanded upon in the actual story, but I don't have enough time to go through that in this video. Anyway, Eivor escapes with, who later becomes his stepbrother Sigurd, but then Sigurd and Eivor get separated, ending with Eivor getting bit in the neck by a wolf, gaining the nickname Wolf Kissed. Time then goes on, and Sigurd and Eivor become much older and want to leave Norway for conquest in England. Now this is basically the backstory of this generation of Assassin's Creed character, but in my personal opinion, I don't feel as attached with Eivor as I did with Alexios and Cassandra. Alexios and Cassandra were abandoned when they were young, become a mercenary, and go on a quest to find their parents. In their case, they have more of a rags to riches story. Not some sort of conquest story where they just wanted to because they didn't like the way the political status was going in their homeland. Plus, Alexios was just cooler in general. Anyway, we move on to the main part of the story where you go to England, set up your settlement, and try to make allies with the surrounding territories. Your adventures take you through the pretty much historically accurate areas of Northumbria, East Anglia, Mercia, and Wessex. Each area you go to has its own little mini arc where you have to do something for someone and then they end up becoming your friend. Pretty simple and pretty monotonous. But I must say, the first few areas and a few exceptions kept me intrigued along the way. But it really got dull towards the end of the storyline. Parallel to that universe, I have to mention the modern day story at least a little bit, we still follow Layla around, but this time the Earth is in danger again. What a surprise. Layla, Rebecca, and Sean need to find a way to slow down the machine that Desmond put into motion so many years before. So, they go to track down Eivor's body in Vinland and continue to use his memories to try and figure out where another access point to the Isu machine is. But like, why can't we just bring back Desmond? Or at least some sort of protagonist with at least some sort of personality? Well, you'll be excited to hear that they finally brought back Desmond. And here he is! Yeah! That's Desmond. I mean, it's the same voice actor and the same body shape, but like, he's just like a white ball of glowing light. And people call him the reader now. I mean, really? Besides that, we also have the side story of Havi or Odin in preparation for Ragnarok. To be honest, I was really impressed by this storyline, since it was so huge, even adding two new areas to the game. Personally, I felt like it could be a whole DLC that they totally could have released for more money, but instead, they added it into the base game on release. Good on you, Ubisoft. After completing the main storyline, there are multiple things to do. First off, you have the game's Templar faction to kill off, this time being a different version of the Order of the Ancients from the previous game. Honestly, these guys, including the newly added Zealots, really don't have much personality or dislikability compared to the previous games. Except, of course, those in the main storyline, which I won't talk about for obvious reasons. One thing that I greatly dislike about the Templar faction in this game is relating to the father character of the Order of the Ancients. So let's go ahead and look at the splash art for the father. Now, unlike previous games, their full body isn't really hidden anymore once you've killed one of the five sages. Even before truly revealing the father, I legit figured out who he was. Like, they don't even try to hide it. I've always been a fan of trying to figure out who's the Grandmaster of the Templar faction in each game. But like, look at this man! Specifically look at this part of his shirt. And if you're far enough into the story, you'll know who it is immediately. 
Beyond the Order of the Ancients, each area has its own completion goal by doing three separate things. Gathering all the wealth, completing all the mysteries, and collecting or destroying all the artifacts. By late game, trying to get all the wealth is a really tedious task. The gimmick of how many ways can I break into this building gets really old. For instance, there was a time when I took over an hour trying to get into a single building to get a single chest that I later found out was linked to a bureau 180 meters away. Like, why? Why add a chest in the exit of a bureau when people can just fast travel out. Anyway, as far as the main three categories, mysteries are my personal favorite. Mysteries include mainly side quests, flighting, and other various events. I'll expand upon flighting and its near neighbors in the mechanics section of this video. But as far as side quests in this game, I must say they are rather exceptional compared to other games. They are all genuinely interesting. Some of them even kept my attention more than the main storyline. At the time of writing and recording this audio, I haven't completed all the side quests in the game, but some of my favorites were the lady faking her capture in a tower and then the cake is a lie side quest. So the cake was a lie? What a classic. The final group of objects to complete areas would be artifacts. Now artifacts are an interesting category because they are quite useless. The cursed idols get very repetitive and in my opinion the Roman artifacts aren't the most rewarding things in the world. Finally are flying papers, which are kind of fun. But once you jump off the wrong way a couple of times, it gets quite annoying. The combat system in Valhalla is more of a spin-off of Odyssey that some people enjoy and some people don't. I must admit, in the beginning of the game I was so fed up with the combat system in Valhalla that I legitimately wanted to return it. And I probably would have if Ubisoft's return system wasn't so complex. But then again, if their return system wasn't so complex you wouldn't be seeing this video. So I guess things worked out in the end. As time went on, the combat system started to grow on me, even though you don't auto-regen out of combat. And now I finally think I've gotten myself to the point where I do actually enjoy Valhalla's combat. I think the main reason behind my hatred of the combat in the beginning was that it felt like the beginning area's combat was way overtuned for such a simple area. Part of this was still because I was used to Odyssey's ability to attack, cancel, and to block, so I wasn't able to block attacks as much as I should have. Oh, and don't get me started on dodging. Okay. So when you boot up Valhalla for the first time on PC, the default button for dodge is assigned to ALT. Left ALT. Why Ubisoft? Why? So if I have any words of advice to any PC players out there looking to purchase Valhalla, please change your dodge button to something more accessible. Because you need to use it a lot. Personally, I changed mine back to space as it was an Odyssey. Anyway, Valhalla's combat system also added some cool new features that we haven't seen before. The main one being the dramatic reliance on dual wielding. Personally, as a dagger and speed player, I don't benefit as much from this addition as other people do. This mainly helped the heavy and tank type builds who rely on big, slow, and clunky weaponry to utterly demolish their enemies. But don't get me wrong, dual wielding daggers with speed buffs is a trip in and of itself. Besides the dual wield system, there are two other systems that have remained from Odyssey and another that is a branch off of one of the old systems. So a main change is that the skill tree and the ability tree are now two separate systems. The skill tree now mainly holds more passive status effects and abilities for all three branches, Assassin, Ranged, and Warrior, while the ability tree continues to hold active abilities that can be used at the cost of adrenaline. As far as an analysis of the three skill trees in the game, Assassin is highly powerful but feels a lot slower. Once you unlock the game's advanced assassination, no longer are assassinations set damage. They are rather a quick time event that gets harder and harder the more health the enemy has. Ranged is no longer the short end of the stick and is now more equal to warrior due to the addition of various types of bows. The active abilities in this game, however, are rather underwhelming, and I don't personally use them that much. I used Rage of Helheim to deal with boss types and used Blinding Rush to start engages. That's about it. So most of the game's combat is based not as much on adrenaline, but rather on the stamina bar. If you don't know how the stamina bar works, landing light attacks increases your stamina bar, while landing heavy attacks drains it. So basically it's there to encourage further use of the combination of attack types. The final system related to combat within Valhalla would be the way gear and weapons are now obtained and used. Each piece of gear you obtain is now unique and has its own passive status effect to go with it. Armor sets still retain their full set bonuses and also have two piece bonuses as well. Each piece of gear can be upgraded at the fortune your settlement, so basically you won't see everyone wearing the same set anymore. Although, there is a group of like three to four sets that are superior to all the rest, but I'd say that's still an improvement from other games where everyone's literally wearing the same exact set. Also, a minor change from Odyssey is that currently you can no longer change the look of a piece of a gear while keeping another piece's stats. But personally, I didn't find this much of an issue since most of the endgame gear looks amazing anyway. <sighs> wow, 
that was a lot to go through. I, uh, I definitely haven't rewritten this combat portion multiple times. Although it seems like it, not all systems in Valhalla are combat related, although most of them are, there are some simple systems that I'd like to mention as they do add a layer of change to the game. The first of those systems would be the settlement system. As you raid various areas throughout England, you can return home with supplies to further expand your settlement and add buildings that will help you along through your journey. Some important ones include the stable where you can finally train your horse to swim. Woo! Other places of interest would include the trading post where you can buy and sell various items and the hunter's shack where you can unlock rewards for legendary animals. Within your settlement, you can also find Retta, the head of the Thousand Eyes faction. This faction gives you your daily contracts and allows you to buy items for opals that you would normally only be able to get for a purchasable currency. Besides your settlement, there are also three different activities that have been added to Valhalla to take up your time, I guess? The most important of the three would be flighting. Flighting actually has some sort of impact on the game beyond the 200 silver that you can win. Flighting is a game of words. You must be able to keep the flow, rhyme, and subject of the previous person's sentence. If you get enough sentences correct, you win the flighting duel. Once you win the duel, it will actually go towards a well-needed stat, Charisma. Charisma maxes out at level 6 and is how you pass speech checks throughout the game. The other two, Olog and Drinking Contest, don't have much effect on the game as flighting does. Olog is an RNG dice game that has various rules and special abilities known as God Favors. Basically, the point of Olog is to drain the opponent of their health before they drain you by the use of defensive, offensive, and stealing dice. Drinking contests are much simpler and an easy way to make quick 200 silver. Basically, it's a bunch of quick time events in succession that will help you drink faster than the opponent. Beyond all these fun and games though, there are some things that aren't ironed out to their fullest. Although it's no Cyberpunk 2077, it's still got a good handful of bugs. The most common being the glitchy camera on executions. Some of my other favorite glitches include items disappearing into oblivion, falling into the infinite tree abyss, and Reda not wanting to talk to me at all. This final one has been super annoying for the past 60 plus hours of my playthrough. The answer that I found online was to do the Codex Pages quest, which forces you to talk to Reda. I mean, it does force you to talk to Retta, but after you talk to him and read the letter that he has from Bayek, it still won't let you talk to him to turn in his contract quest or even figure out what's in his store. Hey there, present day Liam here, and I'd like to say with the addition of the Yule Festival and the first big update, they have finally patched the issue with Retta. So yeah, this is no longer an issue, thankfully. Okay, back to the video. Alright. So the time has come for me to tell you what I actually think of this game. Should you buy it or not? Well, let's rank the categories first, and then I'll base my opinion off the final score. First would be the story. So the story I give Valhalla an 8 out of 10. Valhalla has a compelling story, but doesn't have the motives that Odyssey had. Besides that, it starts to get dull and dry towards the mid to late game, but there's nothing inherently bad with the story, except that it's missing the comedic relief characters such as Barnabas and Marcos, so as for that, I'm going to keep it an 8 out of 10. Second would be the late game. The aspects that Valhalla adds into the late game are rather inspiring to future game creators. They actually made side quests that were genuinely interesting to play and progress through. But sadly, some of the other things get so monotonous and tiresome that it falls short of a 10. So I'm going to give it a generous 9.5 out of 10. Third, and the biggest category on this list, would be combat. Due to the combination of the skill tree and the boring active abilities, Valhalla's combat seems to just focus on the straight up basic attacks. Sure, the dual wield system is cool and a good addition to Valhalla, but other game series have been using the dual wield system for years. Just because it's new to Assassin's Creed doesn't mean it's new to 2020. So the combat section is going to be a rather big setback to Valhalla's final rating, because I'm giving it a 6.5 out of 10. Finally, we have the mechanics category. As far as mechanics go, adding a fun unique minigame that increases stats is a phenomenal idea. I'm personally quite glad they added flighting as a concept. The other two minigames just give you time to get away from the combat part of Valhalla and just enjoy the game in a different way. Sadly though, because of the sheer amount of bugs, I can only give it an 8 out of 10. But thankfully, Ubisoft is already starting to address most of the major issues that have been plaguing the game since launch. So I'm sure this won't be as big of an issue as we continue through the game's lifespan. So in the end, Assassin's Creed Valhalla gets an 80%. Definitely a game to look into and add to your arsenal, but do keep in mind the early game felt really over tweaked for me. So try to push through it and I'm sure you'll have an enjoyable gaming experience.
Thank you guys so much for watching. I know it was a lot of information to go through, and I'm sorry that it took me a while to release this video compared to when Valhalla was initially released, but having over 120 hours in the game helped me write this review much more effectively. Oh, also, I'd just like to mention that none of the parts in this review were influenced by the current Yule Time event, since I felt it unfair to judge it as it's just an event. But I did play through it, encountered some bugs, but did enjoy it. Alright guys, I'll see y'all in the next video.